Last speaker uh, is Stephen Quake, who is an HHMI investigator in uh, the Departments of Bioengineering and Applied Physics at Stanford University. Uh, Steve got his BS and PhD degrees in mathematics at Stanford, um, his doctor of, uh, doctor of philosophy in physics at the University of Oxford. Um, the one, I guess, notable fact is this, he's an incredibly, incredibly prolific uh, scientist. Uh, he's, um, his, the applications of his research have led to, and I'm probably off, this probably is too low, at least the uh, start of four companies, and 82 U.S. and international patents. Well, thanks so much uh, for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was uh, trained, as you heard, as a physicist and mathematician, became interested in the interface of those disciplines with biology, and that's kind of motivated my career. And my, I was very interested to learn this morning that uh, uh, I was elected as a biologist and represented the biology division today, which will leave my, some of my colleagues at Stanford completely aghast. And I'm sure they think it's a <laughs> sign the apocalypse is nigh. But, uh, <clears throat> let's try to muddle through it. And I'm going to tell you today about some work we've been doing for the past few years um, to, that started as sort of a very clinically applied question and has now come full circle and is teaching us quite a bit about human biology. This was an effort to develop a molecular stethoscope. And so let me set the stage by introducing you to your genome here. So the human genome has 23 pairs of chromosomes, and here they are. Um, <clears throat> you get one set each from your mom and dad when the sperm and egg meet. And uh, they're numbered 1 to 22, and the 23rd are the sex chromosomes, which are called X and Y down here. Women are XX, men are XY. And if you've ever, you know, wondered which was sort of the more perfect sex, um, you can just take a look at that runty little shriveled chromosome, Y chromosome there and form a pretty good hypothesis about that. Um, and <clears throat> we'll come back to the sex chromosomes in a minute. Um, <clears throat> but uh, sometimes, there's a mistake in cell division, extra copy of a chromosome accumulates, and that's usually a very bad thing. That's called aneuploidy to have the wrong number of chromosomes. Most of them aren't survivable in the context of development. And for the vast majority of chromosomes, you get an extra one. It's just going to be lethal. Some are survivable. The most common one that's survivable is trisomy 21. So you see this individual has three copies of chromosome 21. It's called Down syndrome. And these sorts of aneuploidies are the most common uh, genetic disorders for live births. And uh, you think it'd be pretty easy to figure out and diagnose, because all you got to do is count to three. Um, <clears throat> and that's more or less true, and most doctors can do that. But the challenge is actually getting those fetal cells. Um, <clears throat> and the way that's historically been done has been to put a big needle right in the mom's belly, right up next to the fetus, and try to capture a few of those fetal cells so they can be grown and you can count the chromosomes. And uh, that is a procedure that's not without risk. It's actually got a fatality rate as a diagnostic of somewhere around half a percent or even more. And I first became interested in this problem when I became a parent and you know, saw my wife and unborn kids subjected to these, uh, these procedures and really got to wondering, you know, why do we have to risk the life of our child in order to learn something about their genetics? And I became interested in the question, is it possible to learn something about genetics non-invasively? And uh, the answer to that question um, actually um, started a long time ago. And it, it's a very interesting phenomenon that was discovered in the late 40s by Paul Mendel in, in Strasbourg with his colleague uh, Pierre Matthijs. And they uh, realized that in human blood, there's DNA that's not part of the nucleus of a cell anymore. Okay? It's, uh, it's, it's the debris from cells that have died and lysed and broken open and dumped their genomes into the blood. The DNA is chewed up in little pieces, and it just circulates there um, as, uh, as, as an independent molecule. It's not part of a cell anymore. And um, it was kind of amazing they figured this out. So they published that in 1948. That was pretty much exactly the time that Oswald Avery published his results that DNA is the molecule of inheritance. But very few people had read the paper, fewer believed it. And for these guys, they were sort of taking a chemistry approach. This was just some bioanalyte in the blood, and they measured it. And uh, here's the data from their paper. Um, and they looked at people um, that were sort of normal, various um, medical conditions, and one case of pregnancy. And they noticed that, and they sort of observed, in this case of pregnancy, they saw higher values of the DNA in the blood. And that was sort of an interesting observation. 
And this paper was largely forgotten for decades. Um, the field kind of went on as sort of an obscure little corner, didn't receive a lot of attention. Um, mostly people interested in cancer working on it. But then in 1997, uh, Jim Wainscoat's group at Oxford published this really interesting observation where they were able to um, show using molecular methods that some of the DNA in the mom's blood comes from the fetus. And they did that by looking for Y chromosome DNA inside the blood of women. Remember, Y is the male sex chromosome and it shouldn't be found in women's blood. And it turns out that's the case. It's not found in women's blood unless they're pregnant with a male fetus. Um, and so this you know, really kind of got people revved up and said, okay, we can do a simple blood test perhaps and try to diagnose the baby's genetics through that cell-free DNA. And um, that set off a decade of people searching for that. And I'll come back to that story in a minute, but I want to take a small little tangent here. And you know, sort of a curious person, you wonder, what happened to the first author on this paper here? Um, <clears throat> this is a fellow named Dennis Lowe who was receiving clinical training at Oxford, returned to his native Hong Kong, had a, uh, a sort of very distinguished career, made many contributions to the field of cell-free DNA, and he's in this room today as a, a foreign associate. We were elected together in the same class, and uh, our careers have been sort of intertwined in a really interesting way around this field. And <clears throat> we only got to know each other rather recently, um, but it came about that we realized we were both trained at Oxford in the same time period. And for whatever reason, Dennis went back to his graduation photos and started flipping through them and discovered this one, um, <coughs> where you see Dennis right there, his wife Alice, and then this handsome young fellow right here. Um, <coughs> we were you know, that close together, and it took us more than another decade to meet, I think, in person, but it was a near miss. And you'll see Dennis hasn't aged a day in 20 years, whereas time has not been so kind to me. And I'm starting to appreciate that expression about youth being wasted on the young. Anyways, let's come back to this question of how do you um, work out the baby's genetics about a little bit of DNA in the blood? One of the challenges is the vast majority of the DNA in the blood is from the mom. Early in pregnancy, it's above 95%. So all that is sort of normal euploid. And a, you know, only that tiny fraction of a few percent from the baby is aneuploid with an extra copy of 20 chromosome 21. And so <clears throat> it sort of took a physics approach to work this out, and the key insight was that one should use a counting principle to work out um, what was the uh, proportion of chromosome 21 molecules relative to all the others. And so if you could count molecules and work out which chromosome they came from, you could apply counting statistics and work out with essentially arbitrary precision uh, whether there was uh, a few extra copies of whether chromosome 21 was overrepresented. And I had played a role in developing molecular counting technologies, one of which was next generation sequencing, and we realized that was a very practical way to count. And so uh, Christina Fan, who was a student in my lab at the time, went on and did these experiments. And we had a wonderful clinical collaborator, Yair Blumenfeld, who collected blood samples from pregnant ladies. And <clears throat> uh, what we did was to sequence the cell-free DNA and use the sequencer not to look at genomes, but to count molecules. And so each individual molecule is amplified, sequenced, allowed to vote for a chromosome by mapping it back to the reference human genome. And we just counted and looked for overrepresentation. And this is the relative representation of uh, chromosome 21 relative to the other chromosomes. And you can see that for all the ladies who were uh, pregnant with babies with Down syndrome, for the red data points, there's a clear overrepresentation relative to the rest of the fetus that didn't have Down syndrome. And so, we published that in 2008 in the House Journal here, PNAS, and uh, our results were replicated independently in Dennis's lab a few months later, and that set off just uh, a tremendous amount of interest in trying to turn this into a practical diagnostic. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's important to note up to that point, you know, I think there hadn't really been a practical diagnostic around cell-free DNA, hadn't really been a practical diagnostic around next-generation sequencing, trying to fuse two things together here, and I thought, you know, maybe in 10 years there'd be something. But it happened much, much faster than that. And several large-scale clinical trials were launched right away. They read out in about three years, tested on thousands of women, uh, as opposed to a few dozen. All the results held up. And the test is now available in the clinic worldwide. Something like uh, half a dozen companies are offering one version or another that all use this counting principle. And last year, about half a million women received the test. Um, <clears throat> And if you do the math and assume these are all people who avoided invasive tests, that's a few thousand lives saved. So I wasn't involved in the, in the 
in the uh, sort of clinical trials and all that, we were back in the lab working on other applications of the counting principle. And it turns out you can, it's a very general approach, and you can use it not just to look for overrepresentations of one chromosome with respect to the rest, but you can look for overrepresentation of different regions of the genome, um, things like copy number variants, which are um, uh, sort of structural variation, which are the source of, uh, of many cases of de novo, cases of autism, intellectual disability. And you can even take it down to the single base pair level and use that counting principle to uh, measure the, the genome of the baby before it's born. And that's something that we, we worked on, we were able to demonstrate a few years ago. And um, this opens up many, many other possibilities for uh, non-invasive genetic diagnostics, especially for conditions where you want to be prepared to treat the baby right after they're born, metabolic disorders, immune disorders, and so forth. Now, um, in one of those other cosmic coincidences, uh, I'm also going to talk to you a bit about organ transplantation. And if The Economist was educating you about what happens before the transplant operation, I'm going to educate you. The physicist can educate you a bit about what happens after the transplant. Um, and it turns out um, that uh, uh, the reason why all this matching has to happen is that one wants to prevent the immune system of the recipient from attacking the new organ um, and, and trying to destroy it. And um, in kidneys, there's ways to do that matching genetically that sort of uh, uh, reduces the probability of that happening but doesn't eliminate it completely. In the case of things like heart and lung transplant, uh, it's, it's, it's basically not possible to do the matching due to, let's call it, the laws of supply and demand. Um, and so when there's an organ available, it gets transplanted into whoever's waiting next. And so this is a big concern on the part of the doctors about how to manage um, rejection, and they do it all post hoc. So these patients are very heavily immunosuppressed. They're on drugs, which turn down their immune system to try to reduce rejection. And they go and they physically biopsy. Um, the heart or the lung on a very regular basis every couple of months after the operation to try to figure out if, it's, uh, if there's, the tissue is being damaged. And that's, again, you know, like amniocentesis, an invasive, uncomfortable uh, test and one that, frankly, is not that informative. And so when word got around Stanford that I was interested in non-invasive tests, Hannah Valentine, who's a cardiologist, came and told me all this, and she said, is there a way to do a non-invasive test for uh, heart transplant rejection? And it turns out there's a very simple way to use self free DNA to do that. And so imagine that uh, uh, someone with all their uh, uh, sort of um, organs they were born with, um, uh, what the self free DNA in their blood looks like, it's all going to be derived from the same genome, their genome. And so let's call that genome red. All the SNPs and polymorphisms that are unique to that person, all the DNA in the blood will be that, we'll color them red. Now this person gets a heart transplant, and that heart, every cell in that heart, has a different genome um, than the one that, that the recipient has, and let's call it a green genome. And so now, when cells from the heart die, they're contributing green molecules into the cell-free DNA in the blood. And if the immune system of this person starts to attack the heart, more cells are going to die, more green molecules are going to appear in the blood, and by measuring this sort of proportion of foreign genomes in the blood, you can, in principle, get a very sensitive measure of, of whether the, the heart is being rejected or not. And the way to do the measurement, of course, is simply to sequence cell-free DNA in the blood and look for those differences in the SNPs and the polymorphisms between the donor and the recipient. So we did that. Um, this was done by my postdoc, then postdoc Tom Snyder, and here's five patients. Um, let's focus on the blue lines, uh, which is this, this percentage of foreign DNA, of donor DNA. This is time on this axis. This is percentage of foreign DNA on that axis. Every time point, these patients were physically biopsied, and a pathologist made a decision, rejecting or not rejecting. Um, and the ones where the pathologist said rejecting are shown here with red arrows. And you can see there's a very strong correlation with the amount of foreign DNA in the blood, or donor DNA. And when there's no rejection, it stays flat. And so this got us um, you know, very excited. It was done on a fairly small number, uh, you know, 40 samples, something like that. We, but we proved the principle, um, published this in 2011, and this spent the last three years doing a much larger prospective trial at Stanford, um, which is just reporting out now. The results will appear in Science Translation very soon, and it's more like 500 samples, and everything still holds up. And so we're very happy about that. Now. <clears throat> As we were doing this much larger uh, uh, sort of study, my postdoc got interested in uh, a curious phenomenon he noticed. 
98% of the DNA from the blood maps to the human genome in these patients. That's pretty good. Most of us would say, that's a success. Check that box, move on. Let's, let's think about other things. But he got very curious about the 2% that didn't map. And he started to analyze it. And it turned out um, that uh, that DNA largely comes from the microbiome of these individuals, the bacteria and viruses that, um, that live in their bodies. And uh, we began to focus on the viral component of that and use that cell-free DNA to build up a picture of the virome of these individuals. And we saw uh, DNA from many different viruses, many different classes of viruses. Herpes virus is, a, is an important one um, because uh, it includes cytomegalovirus, which for heart transplant patients is a risk for rejection, and so the doctors monitor it. They'll give people antivirals if they see evidence for it, and so that's something that's clinically important. And that blue border there is supposed to represent that blue part of the wedge, which is the herpes virus part of the virome. There is adenoviruses, which are involved in infections of the respiratory tract, also a problem with lung transplant recipients. That's that little green slice. Um, polyomaviruses, which cause cancer, red slice. And then um, these funny things called anelloviruses, which are the orange slice here, um, which have been known for a long time. They're almost ubiquitous among humans, but have never been understood to be a pathogen, and they're not associated with disease, they're just sort of commensals. Um, and they end up being a pretty large fraction of the virome. And what Ewan realized, my postdoc, there he is, um, was that this cohort of patients represented a very interesting opportunity to ask, what happens to the microbiome as you systematically turn off the immune system of a person? Remember, all these patients are on immunosuppressant drugs, and so we could look at what happened um, as the drug doses were increased. And that's sort of shown here. So here's the, um, the, the sort of virome pies. This axis here is the amount of immunosuppressant drug that the patient is on, increasing as you go down. This axis is the amount of antiviral drugs that some of these patients were on um, that specifically take out the herpes virus, so that dark blue slice. And you can see that either as you take out one particular viral group or as you suppress the whole immune system, who comes in to fill in the rest? It's those anelloviruses, and they really take over. And they're sort of maybe an indirect measurement of the sort of strength or health of the immune system, because there must be some very dynamic interplay between an active immune system and the level of these viruses. It's not static, it's, it's constantly going back and forth. And for reference, here are sort of what healthy controls look like. This is the same organ transplant patients the very first day after the operation, before they've had the drugs, had to have it, before the drugs have had a chance to kick in, and this is what a healthy pregnant woman looks like. Um, now, in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going <coughs> to uh, revisit another aspect of, of cell-free nucleic acids. And if you had very sharp eyes when I showed the data from uh, that paper from 1948, you could see that um, uh, Mendel and Matthijs looked not only at DNA, but at RNA. There's also a cell-free RNA in the blood. RNA is the message that tells the cells what to do, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a potentially very nice handle to look at. Because these examples I've told you um, where we've been able to use DNA have been largely dependent on the ability to have two genomes in the person, either fetal genome and a maternal genome, or a transplanted genome and, uh, uh, and the, sort of the recipient genome. But RNA is expressed in uh, as sort of an, an immediate expression, the phenotype of different cells. Different cells are expressing different RNA species, and by doing a sort of global analysis of all the transcripts in the blood and sort of uh, uh, doing the full genomic analysis, we were able to uh, work out what are the different tissues contributing to the RNA in the blood, and which tissues are having more cells dying than the others. And this is work done by Wenying Pang and Winston Ko in the group. And uh, these are four different individuals, and these are sort of pie charts indicating what proportion of the RNA comes from which tissues. And you can see, not surprisingly, blood and bone marrow are big contributors because they're right there. But you can see things from many other organs thyroid, uh, smooth muscle, lung, hypothalamus, bronchial cells. And so um, it provides a very nice window into the health of any organ you care to look at. Um, and I think this is going to become potentially a very powerful diagnostic for understanding which of your tissues are healthy, which are having problems, which are having organ failure, because it's a very direct measurement of cell death that's extremely specific. What we've used it for uh, kind of in, in just most recently has been as a tool to follow human development um, non-invasively. And so not only does RNA come from the mom's tissues, also comes from the baby tissues. We're able to look at genes that are specifically expressed in fetal tissues and look at the whole developmental program of the baby um, without having to go sample. 
um, directly from the baby um, and just looking at mom's blood. And this is an example of some of those genes where um, uh, this is uh, uh, sort of controls first, second, third trimester postpartum. And you can see genes that are on specifically in the first trimester, but not the rest, second, third, and so forth. And again, I think it would be a very powerful tool to follow, not the genetic determinism, but all the random environmental things that happen um, uh, during pregnancy and a powerful diagnostic for that. So, you know, I've given you uh, sort of uh, the advocate story and, you know, the, the stuff with DNA all sounds great, but I like to always end the talk with a word of caution. And Maurice Wilkins, I thought, said it in a very nice way, and I'll leave you with his comments and be happy to take any questions. We do have time for one or two questions. If anybody wants to step up to the mic, right in the aisle there, Diane. <laughs> Did you or find any up. RNA viruses? If any RNA viruses, you know, we've been looking for them. Um, and, you know, in the RNA seq data, it's been harder to pull out for reasons it's not clear to me. Um, some of these herpes viruses have sort of RNA forms and things like that that are intermediates, but we're still trying to fully unwrap that story. I'm sure they're there, and we'll, we'll get them eventually. Can this be used to discover whether or not there has been a persistence of cancer after it has been, if you could, if you'd identify the signatures in the blood from cancer cells so that you might be able to use it to determine whether or not the cancer had been actually wiped out by some sort of treatment? Absolutely. There's a whole field that's focused on trying to use this cell-free DNA as a way to monitor tumor progression and whatnot. And Bert Vogelstein spent a decade doing that. He's talking tomorrow, and I'm sure you'll hear some details of that. And um, I think you'll see um, a whole generation of diagnostics for cancer that are now following the prenatal ones based on similar principles. Can any of this RNA get out of the brain through the blood-brain barrier in order to pick up neurodegenerative disease? Uh -huh. Yes, it does. Um, so we have been able to see both fetal RNA and, uh, and uh, fetal brain RNA in the pregnant moms and also uh, neural-specific RNA in healthy controls. And uh, I think it, it is potentially a quite useful way to monitor neurodegeneration. Time will tell. Thank you so much. Bye. Right. I just want to end with two observations. Um, one is that what I'm really struck by seeing um, the talks from, you know, all of these new members is the level of interdisciplinarity that is pervading all of the sciences. And I think as um, somebody in charge of membership at the academy, um, one of our challenges is to um, have the ancient structure of the academy, which is broken up into all of these these tiny dis sub-disciplines and whatever, um, make sure that we, we continue to welcome people and, and maybe change our procedures so that interdisciplinarity is, is recognized in its full. The second thing is uh, when we started changing this session a couple of years ago, our model was uh, the TED Talks. Um, and we wanted to make them more exciting. And, and quite honestly, after watching some TED Talks recently, and I sort of watch them on and off, first of all, I think what we're getting here is, is much better uh, now. Uh, the content is more, and we don't have to pay $5,000 for it. So anyway, I want to thank all the speakers for a fantastic session. And I look forward to the uh, dinner and presentation ceremony tonight. Thank you.